latest collaborations with the podcast is an awesome small company out of Santa Rosa, California called Roswell Pro Audio. They make these awesome mini K condenser microphones. The one I'm speaking on right now is the Mini K67X. I really love the sparkle and the vibe that this one has. I've got two others here. I've got the Mini K87, which is flatter, and I've got the 47, which is great. I've used that on a guitar cab a bit. Handmade, North America, North California. And what they've done with this line is incredible because it take you take up less space. You still get all the high-end quality from a large diaphragm uh, condenser in a smaller footprint. and at a better price. These mics, the Mini Ks, the 400, 500 range, they do have some really incredible large body mics that are capturing some of the most sought after sounds out there. But I will say that the Mini K series kills. You can replace your Shure SM7B easily with one of these first three mics that I was just discussing, the 87, 67X or the 47, probably the 87 or the 67. If you want a little color, the 67X is it. I like the color in it. The 87 is a little more flat. It's nice, it's got the light blue one here. You're gonna start seeing these pop up all over the place because they're really catching on with a lot of artists right at the moment. So I encourage you, check out roswellproaudio.com, check out the Mini K series, C compare and contrast. You'll see, yeah, Once you get one of these, you're gonna wanna get the other ones too and have them around. They make some great overheads. They make a couple of great kick drum mics. And, and you can also check out micparts.com too. That's a sister company to Roswell where you can do custom mics and custom mic parts there. Check it out. Thank you for your time. Players Pick Podcast. Picks and Perspective with Chris Johnson. Hey, Isle. How you doing, man? Good. How are you doing? Good. Thank you for taking the time to be on Players Pick Podcast. I know it's been a little bit of a struggle to get back our schedules lined up again, um, but uh, I'm, I'm glad that we finally made time to do that. And um, yeah, just thank you for for being here. It's a, I'm a fan of uh, of Doth, and uh, it's cool to to hear from you and see what you're up to. I know you're doing so much, and so maybe we'll get into some of that over the next bit here. Sure. Well, thank you very much, actually, for um, having me. I do appreciate it very much. And uh, yeah, you know how it is with schedules. Uh, I I never take any of that stuff personally, because um, I think surviving in music means you just have to be cool with stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if we if we stayed clinched around uh, every time every schedule uh how stressed out will we be will we be i mean not not just that man some of the best things that have ever happened to me uh came to fruition because i was flexible um it, and if i was inflexible or pitched a fit or whatever you know didn't react well these incredible opportunities that were literally life-changing probably it you could argue that they would not have, they wouldn't have happened. So um, I think patience and being chill and just expecting change is part of, uh, part of surviving in music. So I never take it personally when schedules adjust. Same. I do my best as well. Uh, especially since uh, I do this podcast as just uh just out of wanting to connect with people and not, I, I'm like not even trying to get anywhere with this, you know, like that, which feels good to me, even though it's counter to what everybody would normally, Oh, I got to try to like get metrics and get people to sus subscribe. And I'm, I'm arguably like a bad pod podcast host and that I don't like ask people to subscribe and like, or share the thing. I don't care. I mean, people do, and I'm thankful, but, uh, uh, so I, in a similar way, I'm like um, loose grip on how things show up in my life and thankful when they do. Well, interesting that you say that about podcasting, because um, that's a very similar approach that I take to both Riff Hard and URM podcasts. People who don't know about what URM and Riff Hard actually are think that the podcast is my main thing. And so uh, 
I get people who follow me just for podcasts and they think that that's what I do. And then I play guitar. They don't know, they don't know about the rest of the story. And so for me, the URM podcast has always been a chance to meet people, uh, people who I wouldn't have another chance to talk to for like two hours or three hours. Like some of the people that we've had on nail the mix, I did not know well enough to invite on, uh, before podcasting. And then the podcast is a good way to connect because I can't just call them. Can't just call a complete stranger and, uh, be like, Hey, let's have a three hour conversation. Stop everything you're doing. So for me, it's always been about that. And I don't worry about the metrics or that sort of thing. Maybe I should, but I just, I just don't like it's, ser- it, they've both served their purposes. I love that. Well, I'm really, I want to know more about Erm because that's the thing I don't know. I, I've, I've listened to a handful of episodes of Riff Hard and mm-hmm. uh, I don't know really much about Unstoppable Recording Machine. Can you tell me how that came about? So Unstoppable Recording Machine, uh, we consider ourselves the world's best online school for metal producers. And that's kind of been the mission statement. The mission statement is now evolving um, into the best online school for uh, we're working on exactly how to message it, but for people who create metal, whether it's production or any part of it, there's so many aspects to it that, and the lines are getting blurred between what somebody's job is, but either way, uh, it started as the world's best online school for metal producers. And it came out of me doing a bunch of courses for creative live about 10 years ago. Um, my, my really good friend, Finn McKenty, people know him for his YouTube channel, punk rock NBA. That's doing really, really well. I think he's got like 500,000 subs or something, but what people don't know, or few people know is that he's actually director of operations and marketing at URM. And me and him have been working together for about 10 years. And so he used to work at creative live. And when he went to creative live, all they did was like, photography classes so it, for people who don't know creative live is one of the og online education platforms that were legit like not scammer like i will make you rich with my course kind of stuff like mm-hmm. actual legit platform they were one of the yeah. first and they were started by this guy chase jarvis who's an incredible photographer just top tier unbelievable and also an entrepreneur and so most of their stuff was photography based and when finn got a job there he petitioned them to start uh, an audio channel along you know parallel to their business channel or photography channel and i basically i helped him with that pitch and then i became uh the first producer to go on there and give a course i really didn't want to i was a little against the idea because i was uncomfortable with it but i did it anyways because I, I wanted to do it for him. And also I helped put the pitch together. So uh, had to see it through and then it went great. It went really, really great. So um, I actually enjoyed it more than producing bands and kind of felt weird about it because I was producing bands full time at that point. So I just started making more courses, creative live, and then introducing Finn to my network and bringing other producers on. But my courses would typically do better than producers that were way more famous, like actually good producers. Um, I never consider myself actually like a well-known or awesome producer. I was okay, but guys with like actual status um, and actual like record sales, uh, my classes were doing better. And so starting to think, I gotta pay attention to this because I know what it's like when nobody cares about the thing you're doing because that's what it was like in my band the bef- back in the day like we just mm-hmm. tried and tried and tried and it was like swimming swimming against a a really really strong current it, like i guess you would say no product market fit back then mm-hmm. uh so i know what that feels like i know what it feels like to put everything into something and no matter what you do it's like you barely get any gains and so also with production it just wasn't moving the way i wanted it was moving but not not the way I w- like things to move. And then I started doing this and then boom, like it's moving. It, it was such a contrast and I actually enjoyed it that I asked Finn if Creative Live would hire me 
so I could run the audio channel with him. And he said, no chance, uh-huh. not going to happen. Not even going to bring it up to them. You're going to hate the culture here. They're going to hate you. It's not going to, it's not going to work. Mm. It like, so no. So I was like, okay, but I'm going to, I'm going to do it on my own then. Uh, <laughs> be ready. Um, I don't know if he took me seriously or not, but that's what I did. So, um, I hit up Joey Sturgis actually, because I saw that he made a post about starting an online school and I really didn't want to be competing with him at that point. So I just hit him up out of nowhere and said, Hey, you're doing this. You say you're going to do this. I'm going to do it too. We may as well not be competing. Why don't we talk? Mm. And from there, uh, URM was basically the way that people know it now. It kind of, that's where it started evolving into what you know it as now. A few years later, you know, Nail the Mix happened. Nail the Mix actually is an idea I had back in the Creative Live days. I just could, didn't have the means to facilitate it. But the moment Nail the Mix came out at the end of uh, 2015, Nail the Mix is our program where we give people raw multi tracks from real bands. Um, and then we have the person who actually mixed it in real life show how they did it. Uh, and we license them from the labels. It's like the real thing. It's like, wow. You no, know, if awesome. we say it's Opeth, these are Opeth tracks like Meshuga. Um, this month is Nickelback. Like it's, it's crazy. Like, it spanned the, spans the range from the most obscure black metal to fucking Nickelback. And that just took off immediately. Like from month one, it was just like an explosion. And it just kept going from there. It, again, it was that contrast. It was like the product market fit was so strong and so obvious that it, was, it would have been stupid to not just funnel all energy into that. And mm. so... Yeah, that that's from there. We just kept doing Nail the Mix every single month um, till now. It was still going and just started adding more and more courses. And now there's like thousands of hours of content on the site. And so it's a pretty big thing now. And that's amazing, man. Uh, congratulations on the success of you. Erm, you know, and Nail the Mix. I mean, that's such a great idea. I can see why it's so popular because, uh, to 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 be able to get inside these particular mixes that are favored and loved all around for their particular uniqueness and and probably wall of sound and like presence of all the instruments right the unique qualities and be able to like unlock this and are you offering these stems for people for like members to then yeah mix as well just to clarify they're not stems they're raw multi-tracks so oh. it's raw uh wow. just saying because like j- because stems are pre-mixed so like you know these are the way the mixer got them whether you know if they got them from another producer or they mixed it themselves like these are in an unmixed uh basically doesn't mean that they're unprocessed because you know some people process on the way in and mm-hmm. some producers kind of like are building the mix as they go so you know the levels of rawness fluctuate but yeah these are the way i put it is uh if the producer was going to send this off to a different mixer this is what they would send mm-hmm. and yeah uh people who sign up uh they they get access to the ones that they sign up for. So basically they're a sign up now they'd get access to Nickelback and then everything moving forward. If they wanted stuff from the past, that's kind of like, uh, you got to get them individually. Um, because we have licenses on these that aren't perpetual. We have to keep renewing the license. So we can't just offer, offer it forever for everybody. Um, maybe that'll change, but yeah, it, people seem to be pretty cool with it though. Um, you know, and that's kind of a similar a similar sort of idea between Riff for Riff Hard was uh, we were thinking, you know, me, Joe, and Joel were thinking, how do we how do we take what we just did for recording and apply it to metal guitar? Uh, because metal guitar is something that you know that there was a lot of there's a lot of stuff that covered it. Kind of uh, there were individual books you know that i remember growing up there were dvds um but a lot of it was just focused on lead playing which is great but 
focused on lead playing and not the big overall picture of becoming a sick metal guitar player Mm -hmm. um where it's everything from tone to uh to down picking also lead of course but that and that actually trains you from uh even if you're advanced there it can help you get better but it's the same idea it's just a place for people to go learn how to actually do it for real in heavy music um and we don't go outside of heavy music with either of them that's great i mean we you need to be specific if you really want to hit the market i think and in in usually nailing what it is that you're aiming for you'll get a lot of overflow from other that are people on the edge of rock and pop that are interested in mm-hmm. advancing their skills and they end up funneling into you anyway right well i call it the heavy music umbrella mm. so it, for me I, I consider what we do the heavy music umbrella so there could be pop punk it could be nickelback it could be arc spire you know mm. it could be Meshuga, like or lamb of god like it doesn't matter if it's got heavy guitars and um you know heavy guitars drums bass you know like the rock band setup uh then then we're then it's cool we're we're good to go because those skills are totally transferable i still think that like if you know how to mix metal you could probably figure out how to mix any genre so we have noticed that there are people who will sign up uh for urm just because they're they want something new but they're a little skeptical like especially like if they're an edm or something like that and then they realize that it's totally transferable and what what makes you say that that if you can mix metal you can probably mix anything well because metal i mean you've been to live shows they typically yep. sound like garbage, right? You've been to yep. band practices. They typically sound like garbage. Um, anyone who's tried to record their own stuff, uh, the default state for metal is sounding like absolute noise. And it's because that's actually what it is, like distortion mm-hmm. layered on distortion, layered on distortion. Um, you know, and the things that don't have distortion you add distortion to them. You add distortion to vocals, like add saturation to drums. It's just noise upon noise. And then the arrangements shouldn't make any sense musically. Like all these other genres have space where Mm. everything kind of lives in its own frequency range and it all, it works together very, very nicely. I'm not going to say it mixes itself, but uh, it works. If you take metal, um, even the best metal arrangement without mixing to some degree or tracking it, tracking it in a way that's like pre-mixed almost, it's going to sound like absolute garbage. And so metal, a really good metal or heavy rock mix is like the, it's the crafting of chaos into this organized, beautiful, intense, purposeful piece of music. It's, it's like something that shouldn't exist. Mm, mm -hmm. I can say, yeah. So I, it's the, it's the competition amongst the the heavy layering and constant distortion on top of distortion yeah and just think about it like detuned guitars with a bass in the same frequency range with a kick that's going super super fast with low vocals and then some bands you start adding lead guitar layers and then synth layers and then backup vocal layers and they're all inhabiting the same frequency ranges at the same exact time and somehow you got to be able to like it's got to all work together. Mm. It, it it's crazy. It's um, it's definitely like a big science experiment. I mean, you just exper- I mean, you just explained or uh, described DOS in a way. I mean, I was watching one of the new videos that I, I love. Uh, it's not the first the first single. Uh, no rest, no end. Yes, no rest, no end. That one, it, you got the guests and like the video. It's like it's nice because yeah. I can kind of tell what's going on and it kind of shifts through, you know, the playthrough. Um, but it's really representative of all the uh, layers that are going on there. And I know that's not easy. You have to like have a uh, a method uh, and learn these techniques to tuck these different frequencies in the right places so that they can live simultaneously next to each other, right? Yeah, so No Rest, No End is 
an insane song and that's that's why we decided to go with that one first after being gone for 12 years because uh you know people could be skeptical after uh after a band is gone for 12 years but the thing about that song um is that there's so much going on there's so many individual layers that they all work together that i i feel like it it will enhance your experience if you kind of actually uh, can key in on those things. And I figured it'll be really impressive if people can actually see us play. And we brought the guests in because uh, there's more guitar parts than Jesse and I can can handle. Like even if the guests were playing just solos, we had them play some of the extra parts, like parts where there would be a fourth or a fifth or a sixth guitar just so that you know it's more like a an orchestral thing where mm. there are that many individual voices happening at the same time and definitely the video was cut in order in a way to highlight i guess the most important part or the most important groups of parts that were happening at that time um but you know jens bogren the guy who mixed it uh he did a walkthrough of the mix uh that's available on the Bogren Digital YouTube channel. Um, and also Jesse Zaretti and I, uh, we did a walkthrough of Jesse's orchestral parts and the synth parts. So if people want to see just how like layered this arrangement is, um, there are those videos available. But yeah, that that is kind of what we do is we layer the hell out of music. But I would like to think that uh, as far as metal arrangements go, uh, we're, we're okay at it. And, and there's lots of, uh, lots of cutting that happens. Sure. So, yeah. Like, uh, like for instance, when I was sitting with Jens in Sweden, mixing that song, we were making lots of decisions about, okay, uh, less vocal layers here. Like, do we need all of these orchestral instruments here? Or are there any that are just taking up space, but aren't adding like, what is, what needs to be the primary focus for this part? What needs to carry the energy forward for this part? And actually, when you think about it that way, it's a lot more simple because that's mm. that's what a lot of mixers do, even with simple arrangements, is you're just always thinking about what is it that's propelling the song forward? Is it the vocal at this point in time? Is it the rhythm guitar? Like, what, what's your what's your foreground, background, middle ground? What are those elements? And then you mix accordingly. And then it's the same with a huge arrangement like this. Like even if there's 230 tracks, there's still going to be like a melody. That's the main thing, right? There's still going right. to be, there's still going to be background, middle ground, foreground. So it's just a matter of figuring that out and then asking the question of, is this getting in the way of it? Does that have to be cut, turned down, filtered, mm. all the above? Right, right. Reduce, reduce, reduce until yes. you have all only essential pieces, right? Only yes. Essential. Yeah, uh, and uh, that in that you know framework, uh, you know, mixing is uh, a lot like life. <laughs> um, I yes. Was, you know, it's like reduce. How much? There's so much chaos, and we're trying to, re you know, at least in my world, I'm always trying to reduce. How, what what is not essential here? What what can I get get away without having in the mix so that I can declutter this part of my life and simplify, despite trying to do complex, uh, complicated things all the time. You know, it's hard, isn't it? Oh man, yeah. And you know, I mean, we're always we're always blindsided with something, man. And um, so there's, I think about it in the the way of uh, you know. Uh, e emotional content and like faders and I, when I when I think about mixing because I'm I, I'm such a baby mixer I'm still like playing with easy mix too you know uh, and I have like uh, just simple simple songs that I mess with for myself so I'm not trying to layer the things that and do the complicated stuff that you guys are doing but I I, I adore it and I and I look Thank up you. to it you know so yeah man and you know just the parallels between uh music in her life and uh, our art imitating life life imitating art and i know <laughs> and i feel that it's and it's also the uh, there's a parallel there where it's hard to do because in the moment everything you're doing 
usually, I mean, if maybe not everything, but lots of things that you're doing in the moment, you can make yourself feel like they're important and like they really, really matter. And especially if you're in it, uh, you can lose perspective and same like when you're writing, um, it, you can, you could have worked a long time on some like lead part or some section of a song. And because you spent a long time on it, you can trick yourself into thinking that it's essential or it matters just like some habits that you might have in your life that you just have gotten used to doing over and over and over. Um, you know, certain work habits, certain projects that you're used to saying yes to, where in reality you would be better off saying no or delegating uh, or reducing or pushing back it just so that you could have more brain ram for the things that actually matter. But it's really hard. It's really hard to figure those things out. And it's really hard to see your habits for what they actually are from an outsider's perspective. That's why you hire producers and mixers. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yep. I, I hear that big time. I just even having a couple of extra eyes or ears on the thing at, you know, is helpful just to have feedback. Even if sometimes I notice that like, I, I want to show somebody something I'm like, Hey, just listen to this. What's your reaction. And whether it's good or bad, I just like want to bounce it off of somebody. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I might not even change. They might say, Oh man, you should change all this and do this. And I'm like, yeah, great. Not change anything. Appreciate you. And then move on with my own thing. But sometimes I, I need to just the, the simple act of uh, sharing it, um, bouncing it off somebody else, uh, either confirms or denies like something that was going on inside me around it. Yeah. Cause it's no longer just about you and being in your own head. I, I have a, I, I've learned that when I do that, seek feedback that um, I need to, I need to interpret what I'm getting back uh, because, you know, people, people don't want to hurt your feelings Mm -hmm. um, you know, they don't, they don't want to lie to you, but they don't want to hurt your feelings. And some people are, you know, conflict averse or avoidant nature with their personalities. And so I, I have this, uh, at least with Doth, I kind of have this, this thing now where when I send them something I'm working on, there's, there's like stuff where it'll be a fuck. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then there's times where, you know, like Jesse, We'll say something like, looking forward to hearing it as it develops further. <laughs> it's like, all right. So does that mean, that means, that means you're not feeling it. Um, maybe you might feel it if I develop further, but what that means is at this point in time, right now, it's not a fuck yeah. And if it's not a fuck yeah, then to, I need to make the decision. Am I moving on? to something else or am I going to like completely reimagine this? But um, I have this, uh, the saying that if there is a question, there is no question. So if, uh, if I'm getting anything, but a fuck, yeah, there's no question. It's not there. It's not it. doesn't matter how much I like it. Yeah. Well, it helps to have a guy. I mean, when you have great company like Jesse's already and your, your, your team, right? Like your band and uh, that you work with, you, you uh, over time have a sense of like, like you said, like, oh, he's going to say this. If he's not, fuck, yeah, do like go hard on this, then you can trust that feedback pretty mm -hmm. well. Exactly. Right? right. But like, yeah. And I, I think that the interpretation part is is important because, you know, remember who you're showing what to uh, because we see things as we are, not necessarily as they are. Right. So who the, we are in that moment you know we can either hear it and I, sometimes i think people need to hear it twice you know and then they're yep. like oh you know what I actually didn't catch the, the this whole thing the first time i it was lost on me i wasn't clued in actually that's dope you know and that's me too when i listen to new stuff that is kind of a little fresh a little left to center or something and i'm like what's actually going on here i'm not even sure wait okay second or third time through I might start to like open up at first. I might not actually be, be, be hitting with it, you know, vibing with. It. Yeah. So with, with those scenarios, um, I also have to take into consideration, um, that 
how, how do I put this best? They're not in my head, right? No one, no one can understand where I want to take it. Even if I tell them verbally, they're still not going to hear it the way that it's in my head before I actually create it, um, record it. So the version that I'm showing them, an incomplete version, a draft, uh, where I'm thinking, you got to trust me, like this is going to be like this and that's going to be like that. I mean, what does that even mean? When you use those words and tell them about how it's going to be, they're inventing in their minds hmm. what you mean by that. And they're hearing something. But like, there's, it's impossible that they'll actually hear in their head what it is that you're hearing. And so if you have a vision for something and the draft that you give is not quite there, but you know, you know that like, it's not even close to where you want to take it. I think then it's also important to know when to hold ground and uh, reassess. That's why I said there's two decisions. Uh, like either I'm scrapping it or I'm like uh, reimagining how this is put together. Uh, mm -hmm. Because if, yeah, if there are some cases where I'm like, yeah, I probably shouldn't have shown it yet. Like what if it came to me and someone was like, you got to trust that this is going to be, totally different. It's like, well, but it's not, this is what you showed me. So this is what I'm reacting to. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm super thankful for, uh, again, for friends. I have, I have my friend, Angel Vivaldi. He's, I showed him some stuff. He's great, by back. the way. Amazing. Right. Great human. Um, and I, I, I knew that I, if I shared something with him, that he would just be like, he would just like, like vomit, spit out like the truth. You know, because I, I I get that from him, and he he can be nice with it. He's like, I was like, here, what do you think? He's like, I I nope, I wouldn't. You know, I'd think about it again. You know, and I'm like, okay. He's like, yeah, you only get one chance to release this. So if you think you're this is releasable, consider not releasing it and reimagining it. You know, and, mm -hmm. <laughs> which I like, and that was that was I ended up doing my own thing anyway, but like. It was it was a great as a great moment to have that outside um, uh, opinion, especially outside of a in a slightly different genre. We were talking about different projects and stuff, and um, so any, that's yeah. I just I, I appreciate that that insight, and uh, you, as much as it can be tough sometimes, because I you brought it up, you know, like if you work on something a long time, you can get trick you can trick yourself into believing that that like you said certain parts are just essential and they can't be changed and you have to work around those things, which is bullshit, right? Like you, you can always delete or mute that track and <laughs> or that section and try again. And, um, you know, we don't always have the wherewithal to, to go back and do that. Maybe we're, we feel like we're too far down the rabbit hole with the, the project or the track, but sunk cost uh, fallacy. Say that again. Sunk cost fallacy. Uh, it's the idea that, um, it's a fallacy that because I have invested this much, whether it's time or money into something that it's worth keeping mm. or it's worth going forward with, uh, like I've already spent, we've already come this far. We can't, we can't stop now. Or I spent this much money on this thing, on this idea. Like I'm already this far in the hole. Like I gotta see it through. Um, it's the fallacy is because you're using uh, the amount of effort put in as uh, as a correlation or as a way uh, as a one to one for the value of the thing. Mm -hmm. And there is no correlation between the two. Just because you put money or time or effort into something doesn't make it good or valuable. And we we get emotional about those things, those things that we put a lot of ourselves into or a lot of our resources into. We get attached to them and it gets hard to see that no, I should probably just uh, ditch this thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it actually correlates in my mind to this uh, Krishnamurti uh, quote uh, that it's, it's the truth that sets you free, not your effort to be free. Yeah. Right. So it's like, it's the actuality of the thing. It's the, the objective reality, so to speak uh, of of the project of the track of your not that your efforts towards it you could have your whole life of efforts and still be a pile of poop you know and uh 
I hope it's not for your for your life's sake, you know. But yeah, but then the opposite can be true as well, and it's important mm. to uh, to recognize because sometimes people will write a great song in like two hours, and or they'll dial a great tone in like five minutes, or get the take right on take one or two, and because it happens so fast, then they're gonna keep trying again and again and again and think it's not good enough because of the amount of time. Yeah, we all do it. It's, mm. uh, it's, it's a tough one. Um, it, it's a tough one. I really, really, uh, I guess it really became apparent to me when I was producing musicians because, uh, you know, you work with like some high powered drummers. These, these people are like, you know, extreme athletes basically Mm -hmm. super competitive and just at the top of their game. And if they would nail a, a take or nail a song in like three takes, it would be hard for them to accept that. Or if like, say we tracked for six hours and then we're, we're starting to get this point of diminishing returns. Uh, they have a hard time believing that we had a productive day even though everything in those six hours was phenomenal. Mm. But like, if we don't go to the 12 hours, then they feel weird about that day, like under accomplished. And you know, it's, it, that's a, it's a tough one. You have to really, really um, try to get some perspective because sometimes the first thing you do is, is the thing. Sometimes it happens fast. Yeah. Thanks for turning it around because I actually, that is, I mean, that this is the, maybe one of the biggest conundrums, right, with musicians and getting takes and doing the thing right, quote unquote, is to to know when is enough. Like when, when you know, was that was that the thing? Am I can I be satisfied with the thing that was, you know, really good already? And 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 that disbelief that the thing I did the third time, the third take, could be the final thing. I go through that every track almost on some level. Every very rarely do I not have some level of that where I'm like, ah, I'm trying too hard on this. I've already I felt I felt like it was good the first time, but sometimes I have to revert and go back to a previous scene uh to to sort it out. Um, but I think that trying to practice that intuitive element is is is, is an ongoing thing. Uh just because also be, for myself as a a really like hobbyist part-time musician that is just, I'm not, I don't practice enough to like get really good at something. I just like touching the instrument and playing and using the couple things that I got my same three licks over everything. You know, like I, I have, I have a little bit of that vibe and I'm like, you know, like, cool. Like, so I've got, I've got three things that I think I like doing and it feels good. So like, how can I be creative with that? These are the the color palette that I've allowed myself, you know, in the time that I have. And uh, so if I overdo it, it's easy to be like, oh, now I'm just I don't have the, the chops that I don't, of that player or this player or whatever. Um, so the, it's usually the earlier, more intuitive takes that tend to land because I'm just kind of being me instead of like trying too hard. It it makes sense. And the, but the problem is sometimes sometimes it is correct that you need to keep going and trying again. So it's, <laughs> right. it's this, uh, it's this tor it's torture. It's like, uh, I, I do think that the life of an artist, whether they're pro or hobbyist, the, the life of a creator, um, there's a lot of self-imposed torture involved because of things like that. Like, is it good? How do I know if it's good? Like, this other time I did this thing that was awesome in one go. This other time it took me six months. Like, mm. how do I even know? Like, and then the more you listen to something, uh, so sometimes you get used to it. So you start to think it sounds good. On the other hand, sometimes you get used to it and it stops uh, exciting you. So like there's all these conflicting things happening in an artist's head and that is, again, that's probably why it is good to seek feedback and have collaborators because it helps you get outside of that, that loop. Mm. Yeah, that, that perfectly outlines the anxiety <laughs> in my artistic world. Like, yeah, it's like it could be the third time, could be the, you know, 300th time that you get, that you finally 
or you or you know sometimes i have to go back to tracks and i'm like i listen to it again i, I want to fix this and i don't have enough i don't have the insight and and uh i end up just leaving the track you know i just gotta abandon the track like you know what i'm done i'm just gonna move on and do other things but more often than not in my in my hobbyist situation i know that there's <laughs> i could be reaching harder i could go you know reaching digging deeper for certain things and you know when time allows sometimes that happens but in your in your producer world i'm i'm curious about your own guitar world of course and then and then also parallel with your producer world about uh your journey with guitar picks i want to shift in that direction i want to see i want to know a bit about like where what you remember about your early guitar picks like has has you mean like the plectrums yeah plectrums okay. like yep. guitar picking like how yep has the, has your guitar picking and guitar picks the, the choice of them evolved and has that played a role in your producer world you know helping people achieve the right takes and the right things has there been any thing in that that you can share from that world I mean, probably more than we have time for. Oh, but, right. Let's go. Yeah, I think uh, so. I think there's this idea that tone is in the hands, which is partially very true. Uh, it's not only in the hands, right? It's also in the pickups. It's in the guitar. It's in the cable. It's in the amp. It's in the cab or the IR. Like it's in everything. Like everyone would call it. Uh, the tone pie basically. And like every, every one of those elements takes up a certain percentage of that pie. And, um, the player is like a very big part of it. Right. Um, they're not all of it though. And people who think that the player is all of it, they're just wrong. The thing is, people confuse the, the idea of a player's musical personality with a good tone. So like, mm -hmm. you know, if you heard someone who was super identifiable, like say, uh, Ingve or something through a really shitty rig, it would still sound like Ingve, but it wouldn't necessarily be a tone you want to use. Right. So right. tone, uh, it's more like characters in the hands, but a uh, tone is in everything, uh, that everything, every aspect of it. And I feel like picking, um, is one of the most, most powerful things you can if like there's any if there are any things that you can do that will make the most difference i think it comes down to pickups picking and your cabinet like those are i find that those are like the the three big ones now i mean sure. it's all up for debate but um i've just noticed that like if i switch the picking or the pick or I switch to the pickups, or I switch the cab, that is going to be the most profound difference out of anything. Because some pickups, for instance, you put the same pickup in different guitars, they'll sound a little different, but still retain character. And sometimes if you put a different head on the same cab and mic, it'll sound a little different, but not as drastic as a cab. Okay, so that out of the way. The pick being one of the most important aspects to getting a tone it all comes down to how you're actually playing it and then actually what you're actually using um and so as a producer i noticed that lots of guitar players they just would use whatever they always used for whatever reason it's just this is what they started with it's what they're comfortable with mm. this is what they got and that's not necessarily the best way to do things. I mean, at the end of the day, the best thing is to play with what helps you play the best, right? Cause you're gonna sound the best when you play the best, but, um, a good player can make adjustments. So there are certain types of riffs I've noticed. That's just a big, like a big thick pick is better for certain things. A lighter pick, um, is better for other things. Um, a jazz pick is better for certain kind of things. So for me, like if I'm doing strummy type things, I like like a Tortex, uh, like your standard Tortex, like pretty light actually. 
uh, I don't like heavy picks for that. If you're doing chugs, I like it to be more like a one, one or 1. 1.5, but not thicker because if it gets thicker, I start to lose some definition. I've noticed for like really intricate picking patterns, I do like a jazz pick at around 0.88. And uh, it, it makes a noticeable difference in how well I can play the parts and then what they sound like too. Because yeah, I could play the strummy stuff with a super thick pick. Like it's possible, but it doesn't have the same kind of, doesn't feel the same. And I could also play the like super tight gallops and all that stuff with a thick pick or a really light pick, but it just doesn't have the same level of like bite and precision as with a, with a jazz pick for me. And so I think it's important to experiment with what sounds best for what kind of riff. And so mm. when recording, I, when re I don't record other people anymore, but like I did this when I recorded them and I do it now when I record myself, I have a lot of picks, um, mm. all different materials, sizes, shapes, and, uh, even though I have go-tos, I still have this super wide assortment because when recording, uh, you don't, you can't just assume that what your favorite pick is, is going to be the one that sounds the best. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to experiment around and with guitar players, when asking them to adjust that, uh, I would have to take into consideration that maybe it's uncomfortable for them. So, like, for instance, one thing I do is, hey, this, try this pick, and they'd play it, and it would sound better, but they'd be uncomfortable. So I'd, so I'd give them a loop of the part for 15 minutes, go do something else, and come back and just say, do nothing but play this part for the next 15 minutes. And then by the time they get back, they've adjusted to this new pick, and it sounds way, way better. Mm. But uh, then it, you know, down to picking angle the picking angle makes a huge difference it makes a huge difference in what the string sounds like and also in your ability to cross strings like where on the string you're picking like you know closer to the bridge you're going to get more high end like there's a sweet spot for every different type of riff and so all of these details like the angle the position the um the velocity of the attack like the material shape size yeah, it all matters. And I encourage all guitar players who want to sound their best to experiment a lot. And don't just don't just use the one that's your go to your favorite or that you've just been using forever, just because you like it. There's, there's probably other picks out there that will sound even better for certain types of things. Do you remember uh, where you started with your furry first couple of picks? And where 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 are you at now? Do you have like a couple of favorite ones that you regularly like are drawn to? Yeah, so where I started, and I don't remember the early early days. I didn't really start thinking like really thinking about it too much until Doth started getting serious, and then it was what I realized was I was having a hard time playing with thicker picks, so I would play the. I kept on going back and forth between the Tortex orange ones. Those are 72s. And then, but now I can't, now I don't like those anymore. Like I don't, those are only good for strummy stuff. Like, mm -hmm. uh, but like back in the earlier days, I couldn't down pick or I didn't have the precision that I have now. Um, and so, or the endurance. And so I was using those to get away with that. And then I would experiment with like the Tortex Sharps because I figured maybe that would help. And uh, I never really quite settled on anything until um, until coming back to it, really. And uh, I, I'm a lot more defined with what I like now. Um, so as far as tor like your regular Tortex style, I actually like the ones that String Source makes. Um, uh, they, they make several different types of picks, but they specifically have one that's a lot like a Dunlop Tortex, but it's like a little bit sharper and a little bit shorter. So it's not like a jazz pick, but it's a little bit 
but and it's not like a sharp either. It's not like the Tortex sharps. It's mm-hmm. like somewhere in between all those. And I feel like that right there, the uh, the point eight eight is kind of like a really good go to standard. And then also the actual Dunlop Tortex, uh, the sorry, the Dunlop Jazz Pick point eight eight. Uh, those tend to be like the two that I'm using the majority of the time. Uh, however, like I said, if like I need something to sound heavier or I need something to sound more flowy, that's when I'll start venturing in other directions. But mm. th- those two, let me see if I see if I have them here. Um, that string source that you're describing sounds like the Dunlop Flow Tortex a little bit, like these here. Uh, it's kind of yes, yes, okay, yep, yep. That's right. It sounds like because I got a little bit more of a jazz tip, but not super sharp. A little bit squattier. Yes, yeah, okay. So jazz threes. That's uh, the, the jazz oh, yeah. picks I like are the jazz threes, and this one, yeah, this one's a point eight eight. But I have, I had to look because I have like everything from 50s to 1.5s let me see if i can find one of these string source ones um because i have so many picks here gotta gotta love the pick asmr i know okay here's one but (laughs) this uh kind of see that yeah let me see that does look like a flow yep it does the flow shape so mm-hmm. that so uh who is that again that's making that string source string source okay they're uh, they're a company that um that i work with that they do really really cool custom string sets um that's and that's another thing i'm always experimenting with that and um and so it's they make they make it really easy and they've been big supporters but and they started making picks so they sent me some of their picks and Surprise. I like them. That's so, awesome. So, but I, but I, I make a point of not kind of like we were talking about biases. I try to not get like attached to stuff just because someone sent it to me, mm. um, which is easy to do also. But I know I legitimately, legitimately like those picks a lot. I mean, it's I keep, the same shape. I keep asking them for more. Definitely the shape that I, I prefer for mine. It just is like a 73 Altex. Yep. Uh, flow. So it's definitely it's a little stiffer and still flexy. But I, I, you know, I working at Dunlop for five years and hanging out with Jimmy Dunlop and going through and making a bunch of picks with and for artists, I would get stuck on like something they would be excited about. You know, I'd be like making something for Andy James and like while we're trying to make make sure that it's like good, like I'm testing it out, he's testing it out, and whole office is testing it out and all of a sudden we're all we're all like hyped on this one pick man this pick it might be the best pick and like and then we go through and like somebody else wants something different uh jason richardson wanted a, a Ultex version of the tortex sharp but jazz three size and i was like that's gonna i, I won't be able to play that because those super sharp picks like i i have all this reluctance to it because maybe because i'm just not as accurate as i want to be but like every time i stop and play the Tortex sharp and I don't play anything else. I fall, I start to fall in love with it. You get, you adjust all your stuff and your, your timing, your technique and everything. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's nice because I feel like I'm not completely addicted to, or, you know, super nostalgic about anything at this point. Cause I've just constantly been shifting to a different form, different feel, you know? And, uh, so I'm always playing with, and actually some of my favorite picks right now are by this guy, by this company, uh, BHL. Are you familiar with BHL? I don't think so. He's, I, I believe he's an American guy out in, in China actually. Uh, but he makes these hand, he handcrafts these picks and, uh, he has a couple, uh, that I hear that they're real thick, uh, uh yes, that kind of stuff. So this thing is like, I don't know, 10, 10 mil, 10 mil or something like that. But it, one side is perfect for your thumb. One side is perfect for your finger uh, indentations here. Interesting. This one's, this one's called the Hodor. The Hodor. Um, 
Good name. Re- really, really good one. Um, and then this one, this is actually my favorite one. It's much bigger. Um, and for for size here, you can kind of see uh the the size the size, and then that one's super thick. I believe this one is called like the antagonist or something that like a, that. Uh, that is a large <laughs> that is a large pick. I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't have uh you know imagined that I would love this so much, but the way the shape is on it and the tip, everything comes together and I'm like, ah, it's so comfortable to hold. Um so I ordered more of them. <laughs> There's a couple that were sent to me. Like I, I try out this kind of stuff sometimes. Like I guess String Source made this one, uh, which I don't know if it's in focus. It's like oh, there it is. Yeah, some kind of like it's fancy. Uh, I don't know what. Cool. It, like I don't. Know. It seems like some sort of stone, and then this, which is like it's like a also super thick. Ooh. Yeah, it's cool. But and I have a bunch of these types of like I call them experimental picks. Uh, people send me those, and uh, like I never find myself actually like using them past novelty. Mm-hmm. But I do think that there's probably a good use for them, and uh, like I- I'm thinking that I just I haven't found it yet, but. A, for instance, there's like this like rubber pick uh, I mm-hmm. used to use, and I forget, I haven't been able to find it since, but it was super thick, and I would give it to bass players when I wanted them to sound like they were playing uh, with their fingers, uh, but I never wanted to record them playing with fingers because it, I don't know, <laughs> kind of makes makes it tough with the metal production, but this like rubber pick, uh, it kind of just got it real close to close to that. And um, it it's one of those things where I feel like each one of these like out, out of the box type picks, um, there's some use for it. There's some use for it. I just haven't been able to like incorporate them into everyday kind of stuff. Yeah. No, I, I, uh, I'll show you. I mean, I have uh, a, a wide array of, <laughs> All these like kind of small uh look at that, yeah. You know, like a big old big ass metal one. This is from Huff Schmidt, which he makes cool guitars and picks and it's brass and it's like a mostly a novelty thing in a lot of ways, uh, for most of these picks. Uh every once in a while one of them will get sent to me, uh, and I'm like, Oh, that's like the right shape and it p- feels awesome. And I'll play it for a little while. Um and if I go back and I just play with any one of these, I'll get into it. It's kind of the same thing. It's like I I'm, yeah, you'll adjust. I, yeah, adjust after a while. But that's what was really sweet about these BHL picks is I was like, oh, I'll order a couple of those, you know, to have around for the podcast and check them out. The guy seems cool. And then I, I it was sitting around here uh, for a while, and I was like, ah, and I kept going back to that one. I'm like it just looked cool, and I liked holding it. And then before you know it, I'm like. I actually, the, these picks can hang out with my Dunlop flows and and all my other stuff. They're like right there on the desk next to my like my top five or seven, you know. So, um, shout out to BHL. I mean, it's impressive. It's impressive that something made it into the into the actual rotation. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. Is because I it usually doesn't. I I'm either. Uh, the Tortex stuff, uh, Tortex flows and the 7388s to one millimeter, um, or the Ultex, which I, you know, I really, this is another thing. See, I, and I, sometimes I'm not sure because I, I played a part in developing the line of Tortex flow with Andy James and John Pertucci and Jimmy Dunlop. Sometimes I think that I love them because I was a part of it, <laughs> you know, like not, be, I mean, not because they're the very best picks, but because I'm like, nope. I was there. <laughs> you know. I mean, it's pretty cool, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a, and they are great picks. So combination of things, you know, it's good. But still, like, like you just said, you have five to seven mainstays. And I think that that right there is like what a guitar player should be open to and strive for is have like a, like, I'm not saying that they should have like a hundred picks and try a hundred picks on every riff or something, but just one every time might be a little limiting. So, you know, having a good ro- a rotation of five, seven that you know what they're good for, 
um, you know, what you want to use them for and what you use them best for. That's never a bad thing. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Th thanks for sharing all the, the different aspects of how, uh, you know, you come around uh, with tone and, and your, your process around, you know, helping others, you know, putting it on a loop. That's a really great idea. I love that to acclimate to a new pick in the session. That's really cool. The potential for that. You do the same thing. I mean, like my production philosophy is to, and I do the same thing with a lot of other things is prep as much as possible. So when you're actually doing the thing, it can happen as quickly as possible. So like with a drummer, for instance, um, I would have them loop a song for like an hour and tell them, I want you to feel like you do three songs or four songs into a set and just play this song. And then once you're at that point, that's when we'll start tracking. Um, and the same like with a riff, like a riff or a part, uh, even if it is, even if we already did find the pick, but like, you just know it could be better. Um, just looping it for like, if something happens after 10 minutes or 15 minutes, like, because it's kind of like running or something where at the beginning, all you can think about is not running, like <laughs> starts hurting. You just want to stop. But then once you get past that, you kind of get into this flow and I find that with uh, with music, with you, people should do this when they're practicing too. I think something happens when you loop a riff for that long, where at first you're going to get bored. You might get a little stiff, like your mind is going to start wandering. But then once you get past all that internal resistance, you're going to start to actually lock into the riff, um, like lock into the pocket of the riff and in a much, much deeper way. And, uh, and so I actually practice like that now, like, um, it, that, that's something that's different than before I took my hiatus. I didn't used to really practice like that, but mm. from experiencing so many musicians literally get better right in front of my face while I was producing them by doing that. So now I know that if I really want to get a part down, that's, that is, that is the way to go is loop it and set a metronome to where uh, it gradually increases over time to where it starts at a tempo that's slow to where if you're having any trouble with the mechanics, you won't have trouble and you can really, really get it, really hear it, and then take the tempo up over those 15 minutes uh, gradually to where it's like 10% over where you want to record it at. And usually, usually it does the trick. Mm, take it 10% up and then drop it back down. Yep. Mm, that's, yeah, because, yeah, that's Yeah. Cause like when you do it slow, you're going to lock in that muscle memory and all that. But then, you know, the, the, you also need to work on it at, ten, at speed. Right. But if you're at 10% over, then, then you'll feel more relaxed at the actual tempo. Have you ever done that and realized I got to change the tempo on this particular riff? Yes. Hmm. Tempo's all, tempo is one of the most important parts of a song. Um, one of the most important parts of a riff. Uh, there's a fine line, though, going too far. Like on the previous Doth record, the self-titled that came out in 2010, which I think is our worst record, we were so crazy about tempos that we were having tempo, like we were having the click track, like, changing like halfway through a fill or like it was literally every single part uh had like fluctuations but there were fluctuations that we we felt made the riff feel right um you know, it wasn't it wasn't just this wild stuff but it was too much too much but now i'm at the point where i think you should find the right tempo for the song overall but then within that each part probably has a sweet spot tempo that's like probably, you know, two or three over or under the song tempo or the tempo of that section. And it's important to figure that out because plus three or minus three or plus one or minus one BPM, that can change everything about how it feels or how it hits. So, yeah, that, that 
it's really important stuff. I, I, I'm glad to hear you talk about that too, because I feel like, like you have, you come up with some of the sickest riffs to like grind on. And like, I, I, there's a couple tracks on the hinderers. Like I just go back to it. I'm like, fuck, it's like, this is the thing, right? It's like so pocket. And so it makes it, it really evokes the thing that I want from metal, you know, like, the, I, and so it's a sad, I would, I would say that a lot of your riffs uh, are very satisfying. That's how well, I put you. it. Yeah. And so, so to hear that, you know, insight into your process, uh, hopefully that helps you know i know that you you coach this type of stuff on riff hard and 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 your, all your podcasts but the the people that are tuning in here that may maybe don't know your stuff and don't know uh you know you from anybody else maybe they will walk away with a couple of tips here uh from from this conversation because that i i know that like you can come up with a sick riff and it's a lot of times outside of your your click or outside of your metronome um it it is what it is and but when you try to actually activate it with the drums and and put it all together um obviously a couple of bpm can make it indistinguishable you don't have all the actual fill parts they don't sound quite right too slow it's you know drags the whole thing so that's good insight thank you it makes a dude it makes a massive massive difference with how yeah satisfying that's a good word in whether or not like when you go into like that riff that's just like that fuck yeah riff that hits um the tempo of it is it's not everything but it being the wrong tempo is going to definitely um leave some impact on the table like it there is a sweet spot for every riff um I I just need to repeat though, like people can go too far with this stuff um, and mm -hmm. been guilty of that. So I would recommend a happy medium where uh, you're not, not overdoing it because some songs sound good at the same tempo. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good. That's good advice as well. You, you mentioned running earlier. Are you, are you an athletic guy? Do you run? Uh, I have, I hurt myself. Um, I hurt my back, uh, so I am rehabbing it. But before that, yes, um, and I look forward to getting back to it. And well, what are you what are you into these days? Or as you're rehabbing, what is, what keeps you you know fit and sane? Um, lifting light weights and walking. That's about and the physical therapy. That's that's basically what I can do. Um, so any any of that is keeping me sane but before i hurt myself uh it was running five times a week lifting four times a week like it was it's pretty intense um it kind of quiets the demons so uh actually what's interesting is you know i took a long hiatus from playing um when i hurt myself that's when i started playing again mm. because uh, anyone that works out a lot knows that if you are and it's a habit if you just stop you're gonna go your brain is gonna is gonna become your enemy um you're gonna get depressed you're gonna get anxious you're gonna have all this like energy to do something with and i just figured well i can't move maybe i should start playing guitar again mm. so uh you know here we are so maybe it was a good thing that i hurt myself <laughs> but yeah, I'd never wish it upon anybody, but I, I I hear these type of stories often where it's like, you know, oh, this fucked up thing happened in my life. Like my buddy's house burned down a couple of years ago and it was like he lost everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wouldn't he's like, you really, really uh, open minded guy. And, you know, he was like, oh, that was the horrible thing. But then like right after as they were, everybody was safe and they, you know, knew that they were going to. Uh, be able to use insurance money to rebuild the house and all that stuff. Like he was very quick to be like, that was the best thing that ever happened to me was getting, you know, losing my, losing everything, you know, thankfully he didn't, he didn't lose his wife or kids, but uh, so that would be a different story. Probably. That might be a step too far. Yeah. A step too far. Um, but, but I, but I, I see that in a lot of ways we, you know, the unexpected 
not always, but a lot of a lot of unexpected, you know, things that uh, cause suffering or pain, physical or emotional, oftentimes give birth to um, unparalleled, you know, situations that we maybe wouldn't have, you know, chosen for ourselves or even seen it quite, you know, that clearly. And all of a sudden, we're propelled down this path, and and we're creating again in a different way, maybe. Yeah, I was done making music. Like I was done, and I never thought that the band mm. that was like done. Uh, I didn't play guitar for eight years. Like, wow. I, it was done, done, done. Um, and it was literally just desperation for uh, not being able to do anything uh, that led me to at least pick it up. And then, you know, one thing leads to another and the band is happening and we're signed and like, it's a thing. And now I'm like, I can't imagine not doing it. But at the time that the injury took place, I was I was out and I had no intention of coming back at all. I, I, I had made my peace with it and was not conflicted about it. I was over it. Um, mm. It was definitely, uh, let's just give this a shot because I'm losing my mind here. Mm -hmm. mm. So, yeah, well, good, good job thing. diverting. The, the energy back into it because uh the new stuff sounds great i love this cover of the philosopher man fuck. thank you fuck it's like i haven't i love death so much and it's like especially individual thought patterns forward in the catalog i worship it all and uh you know just to hear a modern version with really crisp like different you know the teach like the badass bass tones like everything you guys did with that and the guest uh the guests on there, uh, I, I especially Dan Sugarman's my boy, and uh, really, really love him. So, um, Dan, and, dude, his solo is wild. Well, Rafael Trujillo too. Yeah, Rafael, they're both amazing. I don't, I don't. Rafael is on the Kiesel team. I, we, yeah. he and I haven't connected much or any. It, 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 he deals with other people in in the office, but uh, but Dan and I are just been so close, and I love their trade off. They're playing. Ah, oh, jeez, they're both monsters. They're both total monsters. And I was thinking about like, so, you know, Raphael is still building up his name right now. Not super well known, starting to be well known, but people who know, they know, know that this dude is like an evolution of guitar, basically like evolution of a guitarist. It's like the next bar of a virtuoso, kind of mm -hmm. like when, you know, when people couldn't run the four minute mile, and then suddenly someone broke it, and then people could run the four minute mile. We look at players like Raphael, that's my impression is like the next level has arrived. Um, and so, Dan, who is also a monster, I was just thinking, like, you know, hearing that you're going to be soloing with Raphael on a track, like, some big balls to, to be cool with it. And he just owned it, like, owned mm -hmm. it. And he, I love that it just sounds like him and that it's so different than what Raphael did. But what I love about both of their solos is that they're true to the original without just being, you know, without just like doing a cover version of the original solo, because I don't know, it's like covers are a weird territory, right? Cause absolutely. Yeah. If you do it exactly like the original, then why are you doing it? But then if you do it too far from the original, why then it's like, it? why are you doing it? Is it like a novelty, right? Yeah. Like, you know, if we were to do like a big band version, it's like, are we trying uh. to be funny? So it's like, there's this like sweet spot where you're paying tribute and like reimagining this great piece of music. Um, but like, if you go too close to the original, then you're fucking up because you're never going to do what they did. Like you can't, they already did it. And, uh, it, it is what it is. Like, you're not going to recreate it. So the only thing you can do is kind of like approach it. If it was your song, how would you do it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was the thing you guys, everybody chose appropriate tones. Like, I feel like the, the final mix and everything is great. Uh, it's interesting to hear that much bass in it because it wasn't that 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 tone in the bass did wasn't quite there and the mix was you know it's ancient mix in comparison to everything these days um 
but that was I, I was impressed with the way there was so much of the original feel to that song there. Yet those players and the over song overall did feel like you kind of you guys kind of brought it in and made it your own thing. Well, had to. And look, we even experimented with a fretless. Um, really? Because the original uh, Steve DiGiorgio yeah. plays a fretless and it's iconic, but it just sounded like shit. Um our version, not Steve's. It sounded like shit. And I think to make it work with the fretless, it would have had to be Steve playing it, not our bass player. Um, but we tried and we're just like, are, so are we going to do the fretless just because it's on the original, even if it sounds like shit or going to just make it sick and uh, decided better to just make it sick. Better to just make it sick. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, good call. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think that's the way to, I think that's the way to go. Um, it, it's like, uh, I feel, you know, people were all have their opinion on what songs to cover. So obviously we're like, you should have done this song, should have done that song. It's like, well, you know, you should do that song. Yeah. <laughs> if, if like that song is that important to you, Get by to all it. means, go fucking cover it. Like, yeah. this is the song I wanted to do because this is my favorite death song. Like, it, if you have a different favorite death song, that's cool. Do your own version. And I, well, I, I, what I think is great too, is I was just looking at this morning. I was like, this is great because there's any number of young, younger people that aren't, you know, are always, there's always another generation being introduced to death or the, the previous, you know, a couple generations ago, right. Depending on covers and different things like recently stranger things like made gen x like like metallica again all yep. of a sudden master of puppets is a thing oh my god everybody's got to learn. my my little niece she's 14 she's like learning guitar she's like check it out uncle master of puppets and you know i'm like of course that's awesome you know um but for you for doth to kind of bring back death in this cool way i think it's amazing um and and, and it made me go back and listen to the original a little bit uh and while I was there, I was like, oh, yeah, like I remember hearing Death do Painkiller and being like blindsided. Like I would I liked Judas Priest, but I wasn't a big Judas Priest fan. Uh, but they but I, hearing that song I was like, God damn, Priest is like, I got to go back and listen to J Judas Priest, you know, and, yeah. like, and it just made me revisit and go deeper and in here, that's what I love about that cover, too, is that it's very much a death song now, you know, like, uh, but still had just enough of that original thing that i don't know like it was it was a it's a it's a i, I would equate your philosopher uh with that painkiller you know in a way well a big compliment thank you uh, i think so you know music is timeless right so just because time has passed doesn't make music that was great at one point in time no longer great however recording quality is not timeless and um i think that newer generations of people who grow up with stuff that's higher fidelity or uh better mixed or whatever they, they get used they have a higher standard for production and kind of like with metal like we were talking about earlier metal is noise until you mix it to not be noise so I think a lot of older metal uh, gets overlooked by the younger generations just because it doesn't sound as good as the stuff they're used to. And a lot of people just don't, they just can't get past that. It's not like when you hear a Beatles song, like where it's just like beautiful vocal harmonies and just like this great melody and it's super simple and it sounds great with that arrangement because the it works like metal has always just, like I said, always kind of just sounded like shit. So I think that, <laughs> um, that the older bands, they don't get, they, some of them do. And some people do like to look back it, at the roots of it all. But I feel like some of those older recordings don't like, people don't realize how cool some of these songs are just because they're not used to hearing stuff in that tuning anymore or it with, that little amount of low end or something yeah yeah low end is a big a big component here i think because everything's juiced these days anyway so and and hopefully a good a nice wide spectrum right and what we're excited about not all mixes are equal just because they're modern but 
Uh, no, definitely not. Yeah, definitely not. But, but yeah, yeah. In in this kind of like newer, I, I hear what you're saying with the Beatles stuff too. It's like it, it, there's some recordings feel some despite them not having modern attributes. Some recordings are timeless and will never, you know, re, they really set the standard for a lot of things even today. But because when you're, you know, the the art of mixing noise is is uh, you know newer than the art of mixing not noise music essentially right so there's yeah that too and the technology just wasn't precise enough back then for it mm -hmm. uh it's not it's not that engineers weren't awesome back then they were awesome in the context of what they had to work with uh so you know those more sound recordings for instance were as good as it could get in those days and um they did great great fucking work uh just things have evolved um i think those same the same dudes uh if they were you know if they were coming up in this era with these tools they would have also been at the top of the extreme metal heap as far as production goes i think they were they're just doing the best they could given the scenario um and the times and the tools from back then they're just not precise enough like the analog tools are great and all but like it's not surgical enough for a modern metal mix mm -hmm. just not i know people are going to argue about analog this analog that but like at the end of the day you you can incorporate it for sure and lots of the best mixers do this hybrid thing but the analog tools by themselves are it's just it's just not precise enough end of story mm. yeah. so do you have uh maybe three four or five tips for uh the the novice mixer the 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 the, the, the bedroom guitarist that you're always educating it seems like um and and obviously you're educating a wide, not just us, but I, I'm speaking from my own vantage point. Um, do you have like three or five tips uh, for uh, ways to up our game? Like, and as far as like finding what would be a couple of simple things to start doing with your mixes like today? So are we talking about uh, the modern day guitar player who plugs into a computer to yeah. to even hear themselves and writes music that way predominantly but yeah. that's not necessarily trying to become a professional mixer yes okay um i there's a few things i would do uh number one so if like guitar recording is the primary thing uh make sure that there's nothing that's impeding that so what could that be that could be not having your guitar set up for instance, uh, having the wrong pickups in the guitar, for instance, um, not muting different parts of the guitar that will make noise like uh, past the nut or the springs or whatever. Like if you look at videos of recording sessions, like a lot of these guitars on these metal recordings are, they're muted the fuck up. Like, it, so pay attention to what is something creating noise on the guitar that is not supposed to be there and if it is get rid of it because that the thing about that is when you put anything through distortion a guitar amp like that is the ultimate compressor so every little every little noise is just going to get amplified and become you might not even hear it acoustically but if it's in the signal and you put it through an amp or amp sim it's going to overtake the signal. And so people wonder a lot about how do you get a good guitar tone? Why do my guitars sound like shit and start at the source? And I think that that's where a lot of bedroom guitar players go wrong is they're too worried about the other things and not enough on, on the source. Like if you get the source right um, and what you put into the machine is good to begin with, then it's yours to ruin basically. Mm. So that is... <laughs> So that's the first thing, like, is the guitar set up? Like, do you have the right pickups for the job? Like, 
is your cable in good working order? Is the guitar making noises it shouldn't be making? Like, is that all good? If that's all good, then determine what are you plugging it into? Um, uh, are you plugging it into an interface? Yeah. What kind of interface? Is this interface known for having good guitar signal, like a good DI signal, or is it known for messing up guitar signals? Like, uh, if that's messed up, then you're are, then you're messing with the source. So make sure that whatever you're plugging that guitar into, it doesn't have to be like some super amazing thing. There's a lot of inexpensive products out there that are perfectly fine now, but still like suss that out. Um, is your interface fine? Then after that, what are your recording levels going in? Uh, it, le the gain staging side of it is where novices ruin things uh like i mean these are all stages where novices ruin things but these are like some basics that will make a night and day difference so i'm just talking about like easy things to do that will if you're doing them wrong it will literally change things immediately so the input levels and none of these things are sexy but they're they matter so input levels um you once you determine that what you're plugging into is actually fine and you find like the good ideal input level so the way to find a good ideal input level is to strum as hard as you possibly can um and then turn it down to where strumming as hard as you possibly can doesn't peak it and then from there turn it down about 20 percent and that's kind of that should pretty much should pretty much be okay uh and then monitor the level going into the plugins that you're using, the guitar amp sims, because they each have a sweet spot. So, and they all have input, uh, like input faders, right? So you hear, uh, you download a tone pack and you don't understand why your guitars don't sound like this other person's guitars. Well, there's a bunch of reasons, but one of the big ones is that your input levels are probably hitting the amp completely differently so mm. i would i would then um then figure that out like are you hitting it at the ideal input level for the kind of sound you're trying to get um if you do those things you're already going to be in a lot better shape and from there i would just get some fake drums uh and a fake bass that already sound good the tune track stuff's good the ggd stuff's good crim drums is great uh, submission audio has good MIDI bases. Like this is stuff that sounds good out of the box. So, uh, I was mostly focusing on variables with guitar because if guitar players are recording themselves, these are the things that are going to screw up what they do, but like, like crim drums or whatever, uh, by Bogan digital, it already sounds great. Like mm. the submission audio bases, they already sound great. You don't have to do too much. So that's what I would say is, uh, Get your shit together with the guitar side of it, like what what you're putting in first. Love that. And uh, just a next step forward. So you're you've got your great drums, you've got like a great sounding bass, and you've figured out your tone, at least that for a recording. And you figured out a uh, a plugin that you like. Maybe you got um, you know any one of these that are out there, uh, like the neural DSP stuff. People love that. Uh, when you're tracking, so I've got this, I'm starting to lay out and write this song and I want to get the beefiest guitar tone. Um, should I be double tracking both of my, my rhythms, quad tracking my rhythms? Should I, uh, should I be reamping type of thing? You, uh, you know, uh, having a, uh, dry signal that I can then copy and paste and use multiple times instead of doing quad tracks like that are individual, like what what would be a basic way to start by trying to find that modern like fat wide rhythm tone so are we talk so are we talking for writing or for recording or uh, both well, both -ish? a little bit of both both okay yeah um so uh, no matter what anybody says online for wide guitars you want to track them separately right so if you're going to have left and right, whether they're doubled or quadded, it doesn't matter. Each one of them has to be an individual take. Like you'll see a lot of people 
say that, yeah, you can like just make a copy and then shift it over a few milliseconds or whatever. It never works. Like it might work for Rage Against the Machine, but it's not going <laughs> to work. I, I don't mean that in a bad way. Like I'm just saying like a one guitar band that plays rock that's like old school kind of stuff like that might work, might work for Van Halen or something. It is not going to work for modern metal with that super wide beefy guitar tone. So absolutely play them both. Now it doesn't, whether it's quads or two, that's up to like quad doesn't necessarily make it thicker. It just makes it richer, but it also makes it less precise um, mm. so if you're going to do quads, you better be on your game with the playing because, uh, it's going to kind of smear your, your transients, meaning your, your attack, uh, which is, which is fine. If you're playing, if you're strumming or playing big chord parts, like it's fine. But I, since we're talking about both writing and recording, I wouldn't worry about quadding if you're writing, um, there no reason to go there. Like just get your left and your right guitars. Uh, one thing I do also is I would suggest getting a writing template together. So you're not starting from scratch every time. So hmm. would you find a tone that you generally like and drums that you generally like a bass that you generally like, just make that into a template that you load up every time and it's just ready to go. Uh, so you can get to work quickly. And what I do with guitars is, like say we have a left and right rhythm, right? Uh, so I'll actually have three tracks. I'll have a record track and then the left and right. So the record track will be the one I'm actually recording onto. And it just be panned down the middle. Um, and then as soon as I get the take, then I move it down to left or right. Uh, that way I'm not listening in my left ear and then listening in my right ear while recording. I'm always listening down the middle. So I find that having a record track that is specifically just for recording and then moving it down to where it's going to live is, uh, is really essential. And so I do that for leads and cleans. So just have like in my writing template, like the lead, uh, the lead group will have the record track and then like four tracks of leads, the clean group will have, you know, the record track and then four groups of cleans. Um, and, uh, and they're all basically just sounds that I know I like. And that doesn't mean I'm going to stick with them, but sure. I generally like them most of the time. So they're a good starting point. I think the, the main idea is to not reinvent the wheel every single time, unless there's a reason to reinvent the wheel. Um, but again, as far as a wide guitar sound goes, do not just cop digitally put uh, left and right off of the same single uh, performance. It's going to sound mono if you do that. It's the opposite of wide. Also, with reamping, uh, I, don't, I don't know what the reason for that would be unless you were actually trying to do like a real recording, a real mix, like, and the tone you were getting just wasn't cutting it or something. But the thing is, with all these modern amp sims, like the neural stuff or the Pogren digital stuff, like these sims sound great. Like, so I wouldn't worry about reamping. Uh, like, maybe at the final stages or something, but I don't know. That just seems like that just seems like a waste of time, in my opinion. That's great advice, and I, I want to further a question off of that last part there because I've heard this, I've seen this discussed online too, where uh, there have been people that have said, "I don't know why you would ever record with one sim amp sim or whatever, and then end up changing to another one uh, because you played with the reactionary the the characteristics of the first one, and that's what you were hearing and responding to. Mm -hmm. So the the likelihood of something else, you know, actually sounding much better with that is probably low. Whereas, like for a long time, I had heard, well, no, 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 like you just record it, and make sure you have that dry track, and then you can copy and paste and stack tones, you know, to uh, find your final tone. And um, what what's your opinion? on such things 
Well, I think the likelihood of it be getting better being low is a myth. It's mm. the likelihood of it being low getting uh, uh, for it to get better when it's reamped depends on who you're giving it to to reamp. Some people, uh, some people are just wizards with this stuff, and they don't want your amp sim tone in their mix. They could work with it, but they are going to do better for you um, if they just create their own tone. And yes, look, I understand completely as a guitar player. I, I've wondered this too, is what I played a certain way into an amp. Like, why would we then change it? It sounded so cool, but uh, you know, like someone that knows what they're doing with guitar tone and reamping is going to like, is if they're dialing a sick tone, it's taking into consideration how you play, right? Like, uh, if the tone you get back sucks, that's that's not because reamping isn't good. That's because like either you played like shit, or the DI sounds like shit, or the person you gave it to to reamp just ain't getting it or whatever. But I have heard reamps happen on stuff that uh, I thought the tone going in was perfectly fine. And it just got so much better, like mm. to such a higher degree of quality that um, I don't know. I don't buy it that uh, it's that the likelihood is low. I think it's a pilot error thing. OK, that, that's fair. That's fair. But because it's a pilot error thing, I don't think people should be wasting their time with it unless they really know what they're doing. Um, and I'm not saying that they shouldn't try to get good at it if that's what they want to do. But to just do it for the sake of doing it. Um. Yeah, it just it does seem like a waste of time, and the likelihood of it being good is probably low. But again, that's not because there's anything wrong with reamping. That's because people don't know what they're doing. Hmm. And how? What's your experience at this point uh, in your career? Are you still? Uh, are you doing all amp sims in the box, or are you miking up cabinets and using amplifiers still? Hundred percent in the box or quad cortex. Um, I have my amps still. I have like a, my Bogner XSC, a Soldano Avenger, like my 5150s. Like they're all in one of my partner's rooms. Like, uh, I will say that I know on the Philosopher and then I also, who, which was mixed by Christian Donaldson. I know Jens Bogren, who mixed No Rest, No End. He's mixing the album. Neither of them. Oh, and Dave Otero mixed a single that's going to be coming out in July. None of them stayed with our rhythm tone that we sent them. Mm -hmm. um, and they all complimented it. They all thought that it was one of the, the tones that we got off the quad cortex. They thought that it's one of the best rhythm tones they've ever been sent, but they just wanted to, they just thought that they personally could do better with their amps. And so the stuff you're hearing on our new material those rhythm tones are the amps um, on the playthroughs you're hearing the quad cortex. And I think the playthroughs sound great, but like, so I guess me personally, I'm, I'm doing what's efficient, but the people I work with, uh, that's why I hire them. Yeah. Right. No, that's, that's actually, that's also like uh, refreshing to hear too, because I just, I, I'm surrounded by great players, uh, you know, and and I, I have a lot of friends in my peripheral that uh, you know are doing projects, and they're not big artists by by any stretch. But uh, and there's always just a, a differing opinion. Every trying to sort out what what actually works, and you know, should I stay all analog, and should I fight for mic placement on my cabinet, and should I, you know, or uh, should I be using in the box? And I think most people, you know, for all the right reasons, uh, are using in the box stuff or um, a, a, a fractal or a quad cortex because it, a lot of the tones are close to being mix ready, right? Like uh, yeah. and a lot of that stuff. So the question is, what are you trying to do? Right. Um, are yeah. you specifically trying to get good at amping? I mean, at like uh, miking up cabs and all that. Uh, is this like a thing you do uh, that are you passionate about that and have a good workflow? Or is it just because people on the internet argue about it and you'd want to seem legit in front of them? And so you're kind of like, beating yourself up over it and it's this weird mental thing i think more often than not it's that mm. um it's less often that someone is actually on the true tone hunt and 
want to become a great guitar tone engineer. So I would never discourage someone from becoming a great guitar tone engineer with like real amps if that's what they if that's their calling. But a lot of people think that that's more valuable just because some assholes on the internet got them to believe that. And if that's why you're using real amps, that's a really terrible reason <laughs> because they are a lot more cumbersome. It's a lot more work and the guitar sim technology it's just better it, than it ever has. It's great. So I have a unique perspective on this because of the hiatus. So when I stopped, amp sims weren't that wonderful yet. Like the Kemper had just come out. It was great, but they were still not, not quite there yet with the technology. So like it wasn't, it was, they were good for writing, but like I never quite felt like amp sims of that day were Right there and then i come back and it's like a whole new world so i have this perspective of i have this perspective of like really 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 feeling that contrast and the the quality of these tools now why why mess with anything else unless you want to be an engineer mm -hmm. yeah i hear that big time actually i mean i i'm i have a fractal axe fx3 and i had i had a two ultra or something back in the day and i i didn't dislike that it was okay but ever since i got the three and ha, you know just grab the up, update updates whenever it pops up i'm simple i don't deep dive on it but it's got so many great tones that are ready to go that sound great mm -hmm. i can adjust one or two things and keep going yeah exactly uh, so uh, i have a i have my um vht pitbull ultra lead in the closet over here uh, on a mess of two two twelve cabinet, and uh, I love that amp. It's amazing, but I don't play live and do that thing anymore. And um, so I have. It's been easy for me to stay with this because it's just it's better than anything I've ever created <laughs> in the analog world. To be honest, you know, it's like so so much work has been done for you um, in that respect. And I I have to say, that's cool that you have the Soldano Avenger. I had one of those. It's a sick amp. It is. And, uh, mine was set up for th EL 34s, which made it fucking bark like in a different kind of different way. But and I um, got it directly. F well, I got that one actually off eBay, but I had Mike Saldano work on it when I was living in Seattle. So I had nice. Very of, nice. That yeah, was cool. But I wish I had nice. an effects loop. But exactly. Which you can have made. You can have you it can. Done. Yeah. But that was that was my memory of of why I didn't tour with it was no effects loop because I love the way it sounded, but I couldn't use it for lead back then. But, uh, right. but yeah, like that amp is phenomenal. Um, all the, the my Bogner ecstasy, that thing is phenomenal. Uh, my 5150 block letter, phenomenal. Like they're all great amps. It's just, w what am I trying to do? So I'm trying to write new music um, I'm trying to get better at guitar, so I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to reamp guitars. So I, I think people need to ask themselves what what are they actually trying to do? Like, what what's the priority here? Yeah, super valuable question. Yeah, yeah, because like there's you could there's always more things you could be doing, right? So endless amount. So you need to be deliberate about this stuff, and there's a lot of uh, side quests you can go on with music that they all will yield some result, but is it bring you closer to what you actually want or not? Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the part of the reductionist, you know, like what can I cut out? What can, what is essential here? You know, that whole kind of process to ask yourself, um, Man, so I, I want to just bring up that it's awesome uh, to have you use, be using the Roswell microphone there, the Roswell. Yep. I think we sent you the 67, Mini K67X. Is that Correct. Right? Yeah. That's what I'm I'm also speaking on, a custom version of that. It's, mine's just black and purple. Um, and uh, I, I that's so probably the only thing that you're actually using microphones on are vocals, right? Everything else is in the box? Yeah. I haven't figured out how to DI my voice. So <laughs> like, yeah, basically this, yeah, this is it. Um, the, everything else is in the box. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. It's efficient. Like as, as we've been saying, 
Yeah, and, and I actually have like an assortment of mics specifically for speaking. Um, but it's not like some huge assortment either, right? Like I just keep it simple. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean in this day and age it's like there's it's only um it's interesting to think about it cuz microphones ha must have had a much bigger heyday, you know, prior to all of our in, in the box solutions we have now. Well, when I started podcasting in 2014, I had like some condenser going into my API preamp into a distressor, like into converters, into Pro Tools. And uh, I don't think that that sounds better than this, than the mic going into this roadcaster directly into the computer. Right. There's just extra shit that didn't need to be there. Yeah, there's, uh, well, that's just the way it goes. We find out down the road that we have better tools and can have less of a signal chain, hopefully, and actually simplify it. Yeah, totally. That's simplification is kind of uh, always trying to do that. It's the name of the game. Totally. So what uh, I, 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 I'm curious, like, what have you been listening to lately? Do you do you listen to music while you're kind of like working on an album, finishing an album? Um, and and if you are, like, uh, if you do, what do you what have you been listening to lately that uh, really does it for you? What's satisfying in your world? So when I'm making an album, I don't listen to music that much. Um, but I am paying attention to music a lot. So it's kind of a different kind of listening. Um, I will, like if I'm watching a movie or a show, I'll notice man, that is really fucking cool. And then like, note, note what I think is happening and log that. Or, um, you know, my girlfriend is listening to something, some record from the sixties and I hear something cool on there and I log that. So I'm taking in environmental cues, but I'm very rarely actually going to Spotify to listen to bands, uh, because, I like my brain's not there. My my brain my brain is definitely not there when I'm writing when I'm at this stage of the writing process cuz uh also I'm afraid of uh you know I really do think that anything we take in comes back sorry drop to pick anything we take in comes back out right so um I've always been very like protective over what I take in cuz uh I feel like the only thing we have as musicians or producers, artists, at the end of the day is our skills and our tastes, right? And our tastes dictate what we do with our skills. We can't have somebody else's tastes. And then your taste is a, is like all, everything you've uh, inputted into your brain and how you feel about it, whether you like it or not, it's everything, it's a combination of everything you've inputted. So good and bad uh so on that note there are certain things i don't want in my style whatsoever like for instance i want zero uh blues based kind of stuff which a lot of rock and metal especially older stuff is built off of like when i learned to play guitar i did not learn the pentatonic scale i didn't learn the pentatonic scale until i had been playing for 10 years I had no interest in it. And I know that that's like most people's starting point. My, I started with harmonic minor because that's what I wanted to learn. And yeah. so for me, that's my home base. And um, like nothing against blues bass playing, uh, but it's not my thing. And I don't like, I don't even want like a hint of it. So like, I'm very, very careful to not let that in when, especially when I'm writing. Like if I'm not in a writing phase, then I'm a little more open to it. But like, I, I'm kind of an extremist when it comes to the mm. writing phase. So by that same token, I'm very wary of listening to other metal bands uh, while I'm writing. Cause I don't want to accidentally um, filter 
their stuff in. Like, I think, so for better or for worse, for, I, I think that Doth has its own sound. Like we definitely have our influences, but uh, I think we have our own thing and we've always had our own thing. And, uh, and I, it's important for me to keep that intact. And I keep that intact by uh, staying true to what I want to listen to um, and by what I want to take in. So sometimes there'll be orchestral music coming in. Sometimes it'll be stuff like Queens and Stone Age or Muse or whatever, but by and large, I'm not actively seeking out music while writing. Mm. And you're still in the finishing stages right now. So we're, yeah, we're two months away from recording. So right now we're at the point where we're like zeroing in on which are the songs that we're finishing uh, and like evolving the ones that we already have decided and then also learning them. And yeah, it, it's like crunch time now. So uh, last thing I want to do is start like listening to something sick and then end up with a Gojira riff or something. Yeah, totally. So, so how many tracks do we, do you have it narrowed down then to the, the final track listing for yourself for this album? It looks like it's going to be 10. Awesome. So we have the three. We have the three that we did, if not counting philosopher, and this other cover we did um, that hasn't come out yet. We did the three. No rest, no end. Being one, uh, and then another one of those three original ones is coming out on May thirtieth. But uh, those three are the ones that got the record deal, and so now we're adding six or seven more to that. Um, yeah, we're. It's it's like uh, the light is at the end of the tunnel at this point, basically. Cool. And tour is planned or not planned, but definitely uh, it's definitely something that we're open to. Okay. It it's one of those things where, you know, we've all toured, we've all toured a lot, and we know the pros and the cons of it. So we will do it, but it's got to be the right situation. And I don't think that the right situation is even going to present itself until the album is out. So yeah, like we're, we're planting the seeds, talking to booking agents. Like we've had meetings with a few and um, we're, we're not gonna, we're not taking anything though until, unless like it's Metallica or Slipknot or something, we're not taking anything until the record is out. Makes sense, man. I hope the Metallica and Slipknot both pick you up. Yeah, hey, if you guys are listening, <laughs> we'll change our plans for you. Yeah, you heard it here. Like, Doth is, Doth is willing to give you their support. Yeah, we would we would be willing to change our schedules for it. And and invite, uh, you know, all these people that don't know these old bands, you know, into the sphere so they might know who Slipknot and Metallica is finally. I think so. I think yep. it's important. I important to introduce underground bands to new people. That's right. Because, you know, their production was just so bad, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago. <laughs> By bad, you mean legendary. Legendary, yes, yes. Fleming Rasmussen. It's like, I just like saying this name. It, it is a good name. I mean, you could, you could be blessed. You could have, you know, I mean, you got a cool name too. Thanks. But, but it's hard to, uh, to, to, I mean, some names you just like saying. And Fleming Rasmussen is one of the ones I like saying. It, it, I, I wonder what he's up to. I have thought the same thing a few times. Like, what the hell is, what happened to Fleming? You know, I need to look him up. Yeah, there were a few, there were a few dudes from that era that kind of just disappeared. But who like made records that were monumental. So yeah maybe they died maybe they got out of it like you never know yeah any number of things um i always wonder and every once in a while they they pop up it's like uh i had i had, I mean i know there's a lot of players out there kind of from the 80s and whatnot that have you know made their rounds in other bands and stuff like uh red beach like being in like white snake and different bands and stuff like that and uh a guy that arguably like i would you know for the time like winger was a cool like like they had a bunch of radio 
hits and stuff when I was younger and uh, but never they never locked into my brain. Oh, like Red Beach is like an amazing player, even though I had his Ivan as guitar for a while, his crazy like cut out almost like now we would it looks like a headless design uh, for a lot of guitars. But uh, it wasn't until like uh, John Mayer's drummer uh, not too long ago, like did a, a funny take on uh, Instagram. He was like, he's like, I'm not even a guitar solo guy per se. But like if you were to ask me what the best guitar solo of all time is, it'd be the first guitar solo and headed for a heartbreak by Winger. You know, and you're like, if you were to ask me what the second best guitar solo is in the world, it'd be the outro solo to Headed for a Heartbreak by Winger. <laughs> and, and it made me go, wait, that was, that was a pretty good song. And I listened to it. I'm like, wow, actually, I had totally forgot that that was a kind of a cool thing that happened, you know? Uh, yeah. It's a lot of great music out there that's been it, happening for a long time. It's true. Uh Last question, and I got to wrap things up. But um, I'd I'd be interested to know if um, if there's a, 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 an artist or two, a producer, a player or, or two out there that you, if you, you know, that might be on your bucket list to either write, record, collaborate with. Who who would that be if you know there were no uh, barriers barriers involved? It would be sick if uh, Matt Bellamy wanted to be on a Doth song. Fuck yeah, I I will. That's awesome, Matt Bellamy. Yeah, and if Hans Zimmer wanted to get involved, that would be cool too. Oh, let's do that. That sounds awesome. Yeah, I mean, yeah. no barriers. There you go. That's it. No, I think that's great, Matt Bellamy, Hans Zimmer. That's dope, man. I'll thank you so much for for taking the time. You spent a couple of hours with me, um, you know, shooting the shit and and giving us some really wise advice and you know and and insight from your world from your standpoint, both as a producer and engineer and a great guitar player from the uh, amazing band Doth. And uh, yeah, I think I can't thank you enough, man. Um, I hope you have a great day and let's let's be in touch. For sure, man. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Players Pick Podcast. Picks and Perspective with Chris Johnson. This episode of Players Pick Podcast is brought to you in part by our good friends at Jim Dunlop Guitar Products, Kiesel Custom Guitars, Roswell Pro Audio and Microphones, Happy Cable Company, Copper Sound Pedals, and our favorite coffee company, Road Roaster Coffee. Go to roadroastercoffee.com and use coupon code players pick to receive 15 percent off all orders ongoing forever ever well, isn't that nice